Joel one day. When I get big, I want to grow up. I want to be tall like you. Wish it was a little bit taller. I wish it was a ball. No, never mind. Hey, how you guys doing tonight? You guys doing good? How many of you were here Thursday night? Lift your hand up. Oh, how many of you here last night? Lift your hand up. Oh, how many of you here both nights? Lift your hand up. Oh, thanks so much. I'm so glad you guys came out. I really believe that God is doing something special in this hour. And uh, I mean, he's always doing something special, but there are seasons that you are able to discern the weather patterns and the signs. I talked about that Thursday night. And Jesus rebuked Pharisees because he says, yeah, you can read and tell the sky's red, so there's going to be a storm tomorrow. But you can't see and read that spiritually something's happening. And I was thinking about the Jesus people movement. We were uh, with Pastor John and they were talking just a little bit briefly. He got saved after that. That was before my time. But I grew up in, in the Oakland, San Francisco Bay Area. And I just want to give this quick thing because I'm going to have Jeremy come up. Uh, it was like fallout in the most crazy way, the most radical. You guys have seen the Jesus. Some of you have seen the Jesus Revolution movie. Not going to see it. It's awesome. But there were these hippies. They were on shrooms. They were on drugs. They were dropping acid. They were burning flags. They were following all kind of like weird belief systems from the... Aleister Crowley and the Beatles influence, that dude called himself, he was self-proclaimed B666. I think he put that on his head somehow. And there was no way anyone could predict that you would ultimately do a movie like 50 some odd years later on the Jesus Revolution. In fact, just up five years before it kind of really reached its height, Time Magazine put, the only time it ever had a cover, the first time it just had a cover, no picture, just the thought, the words, it said, God is dead. And I thought about that for a second, man. And first of all, you gotta know Jesus' MO, God's MO, modus operandi, how he operates. Can you imagine God in heaven and there is this, you know, a news magnet magazine, Time Magazine, that was like the height of like magazines back then, right? Everything's all digital today for the most part. And they had the audacity to put God is dead on Time Magazine. Five years later, Time Magazine had to put on its same same company. They had to put on this cover, The Jesus Revolution, with a picture, artist rendition of Jesus. And I thought, they said God is dead, but they had to turn around and go, oh my God, no, 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 no. There's over 100,000 people gathering together. This thing is spreading. People are coming off. LSD and dropping acid and having visions of God getting filled with the Holy Ghost, preaching on street corners. They had like Christian coffee houses and communes from the Mexican border all the way up to Canada because so many people got saved. And as I'm watching this movie, I, I mean, I, I cried a couple times and, and I, 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 I can cry a little bit. I, 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 I cried in Lion King, so I, I can cry a little bit, right? But it really gripped my heart because why? I was touched by what God did, but I couldn't help but feel like, oh my God. Gen Z, come on, somebody, God's calling us right now. Oh on the phone. He's calling you. Gen Z, to me, how many of you are Gen Z? You guys understand that generation Gen Z? Okay, you guys to me are so reminiscent of the 60s hippies in a different way, but I can totally see a new Jesus revolution movement Hitting a generation where y'all are just going to go full throttle all the way for God. And one minute, you look around and it looks like, where's God? Time Magazine, God is dead. You blink your eye and all of a sudden, you if you're not saved, you're an endangered species. Because everybody around you is giving their life to Jesus Christ. So I just want you to know tonight's going to be a powerful night. If, if you didn't know, you came in a Holy Ghost service, okay? So this is... Fair warning, Shamu, you will get wet. You're in the splash zone tonight. Uh, we are going to be praying for people in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're going to have a, a, a fire tunnel. Before we, we get into the word and all that, actually, we're going to start getting the word right now. Uh, Jeremy Anderson is a mighty man of God. This guy is impacted uh, literally a culture of campus ministry in terms of Caiaphas on the West Coast. Uh, he's planted so many different Caiaphas. He's raised up so many different disciples that have sent out their campus missionaries. Uh, he oversees the entire West Coast, which is part of the region where I live as well. And he and his wife moved to Hawaii, and you go, oh my God, ooh, and that's a dream. 
ministry? No, not really, right? If you go to Hawaii, you, you're, you're challenged there. There's some challenges. Lenny and his wife, they're there on a wild way and they're launching campus ministries on Hawaii. Uh, literally, as we speak, he's a mighty man of God. If you, I want you, if you're able to, I want you to stand on your feet, give a mighty standing ovation to Jeremy Anderson. Keep lifting that expectation. I'm sitting on the front row. I got I got a couple of things to share, but I just kept throwing the Lord po poke at this thing. Man, expectation in our faith is like currency, currency in the, in the heavenly places. Yeah, like what, what it works for you. And I know we understand this because you come to a conference like this. Maybe you go to any any students in here gone to Salt before? Y'all been at that little, that little thing out there? Yeah, you know that. And you walk in that room, and I swear people could just sneeze, and folks would get saved, healed, delivered, all of the above. Because it's it's not about really the person talking or anything. It's really a pull on heaven of hearts that are expecting, that are actually looking beyond maybe what has happened, what they thought's going to happen, but, but they're looking into the mystery. They're looking with wonder, and and He's the God of wonders. Let's not be mistaken. We ought to walk out of this place and go. I wonder what just happened, <laughs> and how we're gonna how we're gonna take that. It should cause us, it should cause us to enter into the mysteries of God. So just keep lifting, keep lifting. In fact, I, there's a prayer. My daughter, my oldest daughter, she came to me. She's a believer. I'm raising Christians. That's pretty fun. I didn't grow up a Christian. But I'm raising them. It's fun. And so I, don't, I, you know, we tell them often, hey, you ain't got to go get a testimony. You're just going to keep making testimonies take place in folks' life as God moves in and through you. And you got one, but it doesn't include falling away or all that junk that folks tell you. You've got to go get one. But she comes to me in a sober moment. She's 14 years old now. And, and we're, we're just going after God. We're praying. We have a family devotion every morning. And, uh, and she goes, Dad, sometimes I don't feel like, I just don't feel like that praying and like getting into it, you know. And, and she wasn't telling me because she wanted me to stop. She's like, but dad, I want to want to. I, I, don't, I don't like being here. I don't want to settle here. And if you've ever been sitting on one of these chairs and you've been in a coffee meeting, you've ever been in that place in your own room when you pull out your Bible and it's early or whatever it is, I want you to know that the heartbeat of God is not merely just to discipline you into reading a book and making you do the things of the faith. But he's looking into a heart, and even where you say, God, I'm, 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 I feel spent, I feel a little bit bumped here, whatever it is, I just want you to close your eyes with me for a moment. If you're in this room right now, and you're that person you're seeing, look, I, I came in here because I know God is real, and you know what, maybe my friend brought me here, I wasn't even going to come, or whatever, but I say, I want to want to. I may not be there yet. I want you to lift your hand, everybody's eyes closed, lift your hand, lift your hand. Father, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, that even in this place, almost like the faith of a friend, God, that, that those who lowered the man down into in the presence of Jesus, God, we're, we're not here claiming that you're paralytic or anything like that, but just say, God, would you collectively use the faith in this room to reinvigorate God right now? And even that honest prayer that says, God, I want to want to, would, would we go from discipline to desire to delight, to delight in the Lord with all of your heart? Yeah. So just let his presence wash over you right now. Yeah, just let his pleasure wash over you right now. I just see that. I just see that. Sometimes we turn it on ourselves. We're like, man, I should want to. And suddenly we start attacking ourselves like we should have been somewhere that we're not. And God's just wanting to put a wrecking ball to that lie right now. And just say, actually, you are exhibiting more faith than you could possibly realize. Because without any feeling attached to it, you showed up. You showed up, and now here comes the next step, God. Thank you. God, we want to want to, and we continue to step into you. Yeah. You guys agree with that? Say amen. amen. For our brothers and sisters, right here in a good spot. It may not feel like it all the time, but you are. I gave my life to Jesus Christ. You probably never heard of this guy. His name's Billy Graham. He came to Sacramento, California. Uh, had this little gathering in something called Arco Arena where the Kings used to play. 
And, uh, and I was a man, I'm not getting into my testimony tonight, but I was actually on that day set to go murder a man and my car broke down. And as I went out to my car and, and tried to start it, it wouldn't start up. And I was in all this war of frustration and anger. There's a whole story that I'm not getting into, but here's the deal, I had praying grandparents. And these folks, I, I could go on about them all night, the legacy uh, to this day, but they showed up at that moment. I'm out there, greasy knuckles, trying to get my car to start, and they just rolled up and they said, and, and here's what they'll tell you, we were praying in the spirit, and the Lord said, tonight. They had looked at all the nights Billy Graham was gonna be there, and they were just waiting for the green light from God. The Lord said, go get him now. She, they drove up, they said, hey, Jeremy, you wanna go see a famous guy preach? I was like, ah, uh, they're like, we'll fly you food. I was like, yeah, I'll go get food, you know? <laughs> um, I had anger issues on anger issues. My demons had demons. We could get into all that, but here's the beauty, man. I stood there, they actually took my brother as well. We stood, we surrendered our lives to Jesus Christ on the same night and to this day. We both, to the glory of God, I'm just a trophy of God's grace. Like anybody in this room, man, he saved a very, very lost soul. I, I don't know if anybody could believe. No, my whole family got saved after that. I think they were like, if that kid <laughs> got saved, then there is a God, you know? Uh, so, so all that said, I walk out the, the Arco Arena after, and I got this new life, you know, and, and just, you know, no disclaimer, if you're ever working an altar, man, make sure you bring some breath in this. I almost didn't say that prayer, because this dude was halitosis in my show. <laughs> I was like, I don't know, Jesus, you know, <laughs> trying to see you pass the fuck. Anyways, that's just a little help for all you ministers of the gospel that are praying for people. But all right, that was a, that was a bad rabbit trail. But anyway, I get out the I get out of Arco Arena. I throw a cigarette in my mouth. There's a chain smoker amongst many other addictions. And uh, as I throw that cigarette in my mouth, I look at my grandparents and I say, wait, am I supposed to stop smoking now that I'm a Christian? And you know what they did? I'll tell you what they didn't do. They didn't give me a long line of scriptures and tell me, here's the rules of the faith, better, better do those things. They didn't tell me, Jeremy, you need to just stop that right now, we'll tell you later. They actually both threw their heads back and laughed. And they said, Jeremy, you need to ask the Holy Spirit. Now, I know that might go against rub a little bit. Of the eye. Wait, you should have discipled you right there. I understand, I understand. They knew what they were doing. Because in that one moment, Right after my inception in the faith, I, I walked in, they latched the leadership of my life to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. They did it for me. They refused to become a voice instead of his. I'm not saying don't give your voice. Don't hear what I'm not saying, okay? But they knew there was something more valuable than just giving me the instruction in the moment that I was. And so, I, you know, man, I could go on and on uh, about the, the, the journey of what that looked like. But it, it put a question in my mind that I immediately, I never had before. Who's the Holy Spirit? Put it, I guess I'm supposed to talk to the Holy Spirit because he's supposed to talk to me and tell me if I'm supposed to stop smoking or what else. I mean, you know, da, da, da. I mean, just all, if you can imagine as a brand new believer, you have no context for anything that you know of scripture and the word, and this is what they give you. Now I'm gonna reference a few scriptures for you just to kind of stir our attention towards some unseen things that take place in this. By design, God actually says this, that, that the anointing teaches. Can you guys say that? The anointing teaches us what? All things, yeah? All right, some folks want to dance around that. I mean, you know, but don't, don't skip church, man. He's not saying skip church, all right? <laughs> all right, not saying don't listen to teaching, nothing like that, all right? But what he's saying is those that are given the privilege and honor of delivering God's word, whether that's from a small group to a pulpit to wherever you're at, the entire point is that, that I have an opportunity to help you learn the anointing, to receive from the anointing. The kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. I am not looking for you simply to receive my words, but resident within the words. When Sean ministers the word tonight, what's happening is, you guys, I know, I know this is a good crowd, so I'm going to quote a few scriptures. You know, like this, the, the, our spirits bear witness with his spirit, right? Crying out of what's happening is as he's ministering the word of God, as we're worshiping, your heart begins to light up. What's happening? You're bearing witness of God's spirit. See, the anointing that teaches is consistently teaching. This isn't like he's going to visit you every once in a while. Oh, it's class time. Da, da, da. He's consistently growing, consistently nurturing our souls 
And so if we, see, here's, here's the deal in, in, in America. We have an abundance of teachers. I'm not saying that's bad to have a lot of a teacher. Right? Apostle Paul said you have a lot of teachers and few fathers, all those things. But the goal is not to pick your faves. The goal is not to become a church that says, well, I'm a Paul. I'm a Apollos. I listen to the voice. I listen to their words because they're the ones I like. They say it the way I like. Uh, they, they line by line or they this or this or, you know, all those kind of things. It's not about preference. It's about the teacher inside of the word. Yeah. The anointing. You guys see this. This is a big deal. Because it frees me. I don't get caught up in the package. I don't care who's got a mic or who's speaking in my small group. I literally sat in English 101 junior college, barely, barely made it to junior college, if you can believe that. All right, that's another story. But I'm sitting in this junior college class, and this godless professor, I mean, who had reamed me for my very first paper because it had anything to do on faith. And as she's speaking, I begin to hear the voice of God speaking through her words. She's talking about this. He's talking about this, but he's using these words in one moment to communicate to his son. Why? Not because I'm that awesome or she was that anointed, because he can just anoint anything he wants. He spoke to a donkey for crying out loud. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like he can, do, he can do anything he wants, all right? So in that moment, he was interested in talking to me. And because you and I, we don't just sing the song, make us aware of your presence. We're actually actively looking, actively seeking the anointing. I'm consistent. We were designed for this unbroken fellowship with God. Our spirit bears witness with his spirit. So when you read the word of God, uh, uh, you probably heard it said, Father of faith, it says, man, he's given us a road map, but he's also given us a guide. Yeah. And when I read that word of God, I'm not merely reading this like another book that my professor handed me. Or even an old dead guy. I mean, I love him, all right? Don't get me wrong, all right? <laughs> I'm not simply looking to learn from a person. I'm looking for the, the teacher of all things. Because yeah. resident in those words, or in those words, God speaks, right? The, the word of God is active, right? It is a living word. This is how it is. The anointing that teaches us all things. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attempt to paint a quick picture here for you so I can land this because tonight we're going somewhere very special in the heart of God. I mean, all the word is special in the heart of God, but I, just, I feel so significant about what God has not only given Sean, but he's, he's preparing our hearts for it. I feel like this speaks to it. See, some would, would trust in the words. Apostle Paul said it this way. I don't come to you in persuasion, right? Right? But in demonstration of power in the spirit, right? What is he saying? The word is the weapon, but it, it is the power, it is the anointing within the word that we're looking for. Think of it as a sword. A sword is only as good as the power that wields it. The word's the weapon. The word's the delivery boy. <laughs> All right? All right? You just hand someone a sword, it's going to do nothing. Yeah? We're looking for the power. We're looking for the hand of God inside of that word. God, make our hearts sensitive right now. I just feel God stirring our hearts in this. I cause my heart to see, cause my heart to understand, to discern your anointing, God, above and beyond the beautiful ways of communication. I love communication. I think we should become better at it consistently. There's nothing wrong with all those things. But we're looking, we're looking for the power resident in the word. As I was praying uh, in the spirit, Today, I was praying in tongues. If you're not familiar with that, we're about to learn a little bit more about it. But as God fills you with his Holy Spirit, uh, he actually gives you a heavenly language. It's this beautiful experience. Uh, it's kind of like when you get baptized in water, you get wet. When you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you get to speak in tongues. It's just part of the package. I didn't make the rules, but I like enjoying them. <laughs> so, all right. So it's a fun, it's a fun thing. But all that said. As I was praying in the spirit, I, I felt like God dropped this in my heart specifically for tonight because we're actually focusing on this. There's some of you who have not yet received the baptism of the Holy Spirit tonight. Again, just lift your expectation because he's here. Jesus is the baptizer uh, and he's ready for you. You ready for him, all right? 
So that's no problem. If, you, if you've been running kind of high and dry, maybe you haven't been praying in the spirit, all that stuff is a great night. Be being filled, the Apostle Paul says, all right? We're just going to we're gonna break back open that, that river of living water that continuously flows through our hearts, all right? But the, as I was praying, I, it's almost like I can lift and I can see. So I'm praying in the spirit, and there's, here's the picture I see. I'm describing this to you in some fashion with, with, with what I've said so far. So if when I speak words, the kingdom of God is not in word, but it's in power. Of course, we use words to deliver, right? But, but again, we're looking for the anointing. That's why when someone's talking, like right here, by the way, and you feel like your mind's going off this way, but it's actually like the Holy Spirit. You, you know, you ever feel guilty? You're like, man, God's burning something in my heart, but I, I should be taking notes. You know, I, I, you're like wrestling in here, you know, but you're like, you know it's the Lord, but you're like, I'm going to miss that point. You know, like, just tap your neighbor and say, take notes for me, man. I'm getting wrecked. You know, I'm going to just do something, you know, work together. But, but all I said, what's happening is the anointing is drawing you in. He's drawing you in to something very personal. Because while it's corporate, it's also personal all at the same time. And when, when I use words to pray, uh, to preach, whatever, when I use, there's, there's nothing wrong. We ought to do these things, right? But when I use those words, there is the option, if you will, to begin to trust more in my ability to formulate the right prayer, uh, to, to use the right, uh, you know, whatever. It could be scripture, whatever. It's not bad, all right? You're going to use those things. Don't hear what I'm not saying. But to actually put more faith in the word than in the power that is within the word. I'm talking to you right now, but more than anything, I'm trusting in the Holy Spirit. Sean is saying this often, and more is caught than taught. It's like, man, I said three words, but 15 things landed on 15 different hearts or whatever it might be because the, he's just that good. I'm not trusting in my ability to articulate all things. I'm going to give myself study to show myself approved. I'm going to communicate, but my trust is in the Lord. Yeah. And my trust is in the Lord to to. Within those things that I'm sharing, deliver what is in his heart, with or without my weaknesses involved or whatever it might be. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's a very liberating thing. But when you pray in the spirit, man of God, woman of God, when you pray in the spirit, do you know what else is happening besides the fact that the word says that you build yourself up in your most holy faith? Besides the fact that you are praying the perfect will of God and many benefits that come with it, there's something else taking place. That that word, when you were praying in your, your English or whatever your native tongue is, right? When you're praying and you're using those words, you actually move to a place where now you can only ever trust that the anointing, you can only ever trust in the power of God that is moving through you. Why? Because you don't have understanding of the words. They just look like a bunch of letters floating around. And at that point, you know, you understood this, this. But what it's doing is it's actually assigning the trust of our hearts to the anointing of God. So if you've ever prayed in the spirit, let's say you've been baptized in the spirit, you're praying in tongues and you kind of like, you start to fade off, you get a little bored, da, da, da. that's because the point isn't that you understand everything. Actually, the point is that he's drawing the river of God. He's continuously moving that through you and that, that, that anointing, that power that is within the words, words are just the weapon is actually being released and your attention is clearly a sign on the fact that it doesn't matter what I say right now, I'm gonna pray in this heavenly language and God's perfect will will be done. Yeah, you guys see what I'm saying? Man. Father, I know tonight that there is many that will receive, many that will be refilled, many that will pray with others to be filled. So can we just right now just put your hands up to the Lord and say, Father, I just want more. God, teach me. Teach me your ways. God, I want to see, I want to sense, train my senses to discern and to see the anointing of God, to be taught by you, no matter what voice is speaking, no matter the podcast, no matter how my day has been going, my heart is tender towards you and submitted to you, God. Tonight, right now, we open our hearts and we say, speak, Holy Spirit. Speak to us. Guide us into all truth. In Jesus' perfect name. Amen. Amen. Would you guys welcome up Sean. So that was so good. That was so rich. Wow. You got a Bible? Go to Judges chapter 2. If not, you can pull it if you have the Bible on your iPhone, or I will read it to you. John chapter 2. That's amazing. As you're going there, 
couple things. Uh, one, we do have some product out there, a couple books I brought, one on revival, one on prophetic evangelism, two uh, USBs you can put on your computer, but one, we've got 24 hours of teaching on how to hear the voice of God, the prophetic, person of the Holy Spirit, uh, how the words of knowledge come, how to develop faith to uh, see into what it is that God is showing you in terms of uh, just the spiritual realm. So many things on there, but it's called a Prophetic Activation Series. It is an entire e-course on a jump drive, so if you open it up, it's like a car, but you can pop it open and stick it in your computer and download it, and if you get it, you have my permission to give it to as many people and download as many computers as you like, and then if some of you are podcasters, my wife and I have a podcast called Keep It 100 with Sean and Kristen Smith. Oh, come on. And so it's just our, our desires that we really want to disciple uh, a generation. All right, John chapter 2, we're going to start reading the verse 1. Y'all doing all right? Yeah. Come on. All right, here we go. It says, on the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding, and when they ran out of wine, so I say, uh-oh. The mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? No, no, I, I need to explain right there, right? If I say that to my grandmother coming up, my grandma would slap me so hard, my face would still be trying to unfold right now, right? Like, the, the context there, woman, it, it was a respectable term. It, it's actually maybe how we would say lady. Uh, when Jesus was on the cross, he says, woman, your son, son, you know, John, take care of mom. And it was lady, so it wasn't a disrespectful term. But I do want to highlight this. This is important. Up to this point, because this is what's called a transitional point in Jesus' ministry. This is going to be his first public miracle. Up to this point, Jesus has been the son of Joseph and Mary. There's always been some controversy. Most scholars believe Joseph has is deceased at this point because he's not mentioned and he's not in the picture, nor is he mentioned from this point on. But Mary is. It's like when you're a child, you obey mom and dad, whatever they tell you to do. But there comes a point when you come an adult, you honor mom and dad. So it's different. Children obey your parents, but as you're older, you honor. And so Jesus is now saying, you always will be a maternal figure of mom in my life, but I'm taking orders from heaven. Like, I only do that which I see the Father do, John 5, 19 and 20. So it really is significant now that he doesn't say, Mother, Mom, what does that have to do with me? He's saying, Woman, because he's now beginning, you know, Mom's trying to get some favors in there. He's saying, I've got to obey God. And sometimes, just as an aside, there comes a point sometimes when you have to understand that there are a lot of voices, but you have to prioritize what is God saying and what is the will of God for your life? So I'm just going to throw that out there. And then Jesus goes on to say, because it's still in, in the red, so let's quote Jesus. My hour is not yet come. Now this is key. you got to understand it or you miss the message. He's saying to her, she's saying, they run out of wine. In other words, I want you to do a wine multiplication miracle. And Jesus said, my hour is not come. It's not my time. And his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were set six water pots of of a stone according to the manner of the purification of the Jews contain, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. Hmm, very odd. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now, take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. And when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, he did not know where it come from. But the servants who had drawn the water knew just a little thing that I want to throw in there. Notice it said, it didn't say the servants who had drawn the wine. He said the servants that had drawn the water. When the servants drew the water, although they had to take it to the ultimate wine bibber, taster, judge, Michelin wine judge, they were taking water and somewhere in the process of them dipping water and walking it over to a dude, they're taking water to a guy who's gonna judge wine, and by the time it hits his mouth, it's wine. Now you gotta see it, right? It says when they drew water, didn't say wine, water. Another key that I'm gonna bring out, so I just wanna throw these out and it'll save me 15 minutes of preaching later on. And the master of the feast called the bridegroom and he said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine when the guests have well drunk, in other words, when they got their fade on, when they tipsy, when they drunk, they hide, then the inferior, but you have kept 
the good wine until now, or some translation says you save the best wine until last. And then verse 11, this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed. Interesting. He had disciples. They believed. But when they saw this, they believed. You ever had that kind of moment like, like you, you love Jesus, you believe in Jesus, but then you see an aspect of a God move and you believe. I'm trying to pull some bass out of him. I'm trying to go James or Jones on you. You believe. And it's very interesting. Their disciples, they believed before, but now they believe. I feel like there's so many believers that they have a belief in Jesus. They have an adherence to Christianity. Come on, Texas. But they need a moment of seeing Jesus, the miracle worker. Jesus who can turn water to wine to where you believe. And a lot of people have yet to have that encounter. In fact, I'll throw this out. Part of, I feel my mission, the thing that my heart burns for in this hour, my wife burns for, is I'm fighting for a reference point for a generation where they believe in Jesus, right? Some of us that are older, you've had those moments where you were at an altar and Jesus appeared, Jesus showed up, you felt the power of God, you saw a miracle, someone got healed, something happened. It was a reference point from that point on that you could say, Jesus is awesome, he is transcendent, he does miracles. It isn't a hand-me-down faith at that moment. It isn't that your uncle was a deacon and your mama ran Sunday school. You got your own faith now. You own because there's something you experience. Now hold that thought. We're two months removed from the Super Bowl. Super Bowl is an interesting event, uh, especially in North America. Uh, it, it, it is one of those things where Many eyes are glued to two teams that are playing each other for the Super Bowl trophy. And obviously this year, many people watch the Super Bowl, and I got a chance to watch part of it myself. I probably jumped in almost about halftime. And it's very interesting because there's several things that even people that aren't hardcore football fans, they want to see who's performing, who's doing the halftime show, right? And so there's somebody who's doing the halftime show. I think Rihanna did the halftime show. The other reason why I watch, in addition to seeing the game, right? The other reason why I watch it is because of the creativity of commercials. You know that there are people that have paid millions, hundreds of millions, some even billions of dollars to get a 60 second, multiple 60 second advertising spot in the Super Bowl, knowing that Nielsen ratings dictate that there are hundreds of millions of eyes that are watching that. And you gotta understand, when you're spending that much to produce a commercial, right? How many of you know, you don't have like Bubba John over in the corner thinking, I think this might be a good commercial, right? Come on, I need a little help, right? You got some people that are sitting around a strategy room, they've studied appetites, desires, trends, fads, what it is that's connecting with certain demographics and what's going on. So the creativity of that sparks me. I, I, there's something I love about excellence in the area of communication in that. And unfortunately, some of the more creative commercials are typically beer commercials. This didn't happen this Super Bowl, but I remember years back, it was called the Raining Beer Super Bowl commercial. You may or may not remember that. So in this commercial, right, some guy, he's just looking like his face is telling the story already. He's pretty much like, for whatever reason, disillusioned in life. He doesn't look like he's got a lot of joy. And he walks out and he looks up and it's raining, it's overcast, and it almost like his bottom lip goes out like your three-year-old younger brother or something, right? And then all of a sudden, as his lip is out, a, a little drop of rain catches his lip and he kind of tastes it in his eyes and his face lights up. And all of a sudden, he kind of runs to a spot, sticks out his tongue, and he begins to catch raindrops. And then he runs over to another place, and all of a sudden, the camera pans in on him, and he goes, it's raining beer! Right? The moment he says it, other people are discovering this too. One dude <laughs> grabs a big old bucket and goes under like a rain-like drain and starts catching as much. And he goes, it's raining beer, and he's, he's frantic at this point because he wants to be an evangelist for people to get drunk or something like yeah, it's raining beer, go get you some, man, right? And then in the process of him wanting to be an evangelist for beer, he runs into a tavern where he sees actual homebrew 100% beer 
being poured, and he gets this sheepish look on it, like back in the day when car, you know, dogs didn't have leash laws in my in neighborhood, dogs would chase cars. And I remember one time we got our first car, I was in grade school, we got our first car, and, and my grandma like, watch this, my grandma, she was from Dumas, Arkansas, she, she would stop the car, and the dog was chasing the car, and they'd get up to the bumper, and the dog, like, look, you ever seen a confused dog look? The dog never thought, what would I do if I caught a car? I don't know what to do right now. Kind of, ar, 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 and just kind of walked over here, right? It's like the dude had that look on his face. Why? He's running around thinking dirty rainwater is beer, and now he sees in this tavern where actual beer is being poured. And then the, the commercial tells you the name of the beer commercial. And I was thinking about that because I think the substitutes, modern substitutes have so altered our taste that we've settled for watered down substitutes rather than the real thing. It's only in those moments where you run into a building like tonight and you taste and see that the Lord is good to understand that you've been on something that's given you counterfeit joy, counterfeit cessation of problems, which you would call peace. But you only say that because your tastes have been corrupted. You had to redefine what a good time really is. You had to do all these things and go through all these gymnastics because you've never tasted the real thing. And at that point when you do it, it's kind of like a sheepish moment, but you if, if the commercial could keep going, like I would love to like get some creative heads together and continue the commercial where he sits down and understand this is what 100% proof, and I don't even know, from that point on, that dude's not running around trying to drink dirty rainwater. And I'm thinking, have we so, now speaking, I was speaking of kind of this like macrocosmic world out there, but now I wanna come in and speak to us. Have we watered down what it means to have a relationship with God, what it means to be in a spirit-filled church, what does it mean to walk in the power of the Holy Ghost? Have we so watered that down that we've settled for something less than what God is willing to pour out in an outpouring of the Holy Ghost if people will say, I'm going to run into Jesus, I'm going to run to that altar, I'm going to get somebody that has the real thing on tap that's really pouring. I'm, you know, I'm not talking about alcohol now, I'm talking about the Holy Ghost, right? Ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party because a Holy Ghost party don't stop. All right, all right, Zach, help me with that. Here is Jesus' first miracle. He changed water to wine. Where did it happen? This, the, the experts tell us that when he brought his disciples to this wedding, there were only five of them at this time. So he didn't have 12 disciples yet. He's going to gain the other seven somewhere down the road. He's got five disciples. Isn't it interesting that the first place that we're told Jesus takes his new five of them, disciples, is to a wedding. First point I want to make right now that I think is super important is Jesus took them on a wedding. He didn't take them on a date. Jesus doesn't want an occasional fling. Come on. Jesus wants the ring. Come on, somebody. Jesus wants covenant relationship with his people, right? He doesn't want an occasional Sunday connection. He wants a 24-7 lifestyle. He didn't bring them on a date. He didn't go speed dating. And okay, you're in front of me for 10 minutes. A bell rings. Somebody else comes in front of me. I got another interest. And I got something else. No, no, no. Jesus is not into speed dating with you. He took them to a wedding. And let me just say something to you. This thing is going to, in eternity, is going to finalize at a wedding. Jesus is about connection, right? And why is this important? I think too many people in church, I'm speaking now to church folks, I think too many people are trying to function without true heart connection. You know what that's called? Religion. Religion and the Bride of Frankenstein have two things in common. They both may have made it ugly, right? Anybody seen the old Bride of Frankenstein? He made his wife out of spare parts. It was not a good thing, all right? I believe that right now in this season, the, the key to sustaining intense desire, and I love it because Jeremy was kind of going it, is to have fresh encounters with his heart. Yeah. Right now, let me just throw this out there. I believe right now, 
and, and I believe that there are times that, hey, man, we need to run and we need to be Martha's, if you understand the Mary and Martha. And there are other times where you got to be Mary and get to Jesus' feet. I'm telling you right now, I believe for the church to have a fierce and determined spirituality, it must be based in divine fascination. It must be based in heavenly fervency. It must be an understanding that I am loved by God and he calls me to this amazing love affair with Jesus. Oh, oh man, I wish I could get some, some more amens like somebody's really getting this thing. I believe that, man, when you taste the forgiveness of Jesus, when you see the generosity of Heavenly Father, when you see the, the, the tenderness of Holy Spirit, it ought to draw you in a way that I'm not doing this because I have to or I got to discipline myself. I love Jesus because he loves me and the passion that I have will keep me when nobody's looking. When nobody's clicking like on my Instagram because I didn't put it out there for it to get likes by people to be popular. I came out because I want to represent the one I love. Jesus is trying to take you to a wedding. The Bible says the spirit and the bride say come. It doesn't say the spirit and the church court uh, says come. It says the spirit and the bride because there's affections found in a bride. Come on, anybody married, you got some affections there, right? Here is, I think, a challenge, and I'm going to throw this out before we move on. I think we look for better sin avoidance techniques. Like, how do I stop sinning? I, I, I know I shouldn't be doing this, Sean. I'm, I'm trying to stop. Oh, man, I keep falling back into it. I, I repent. I say, I'm never going to do it again. But then I come under pressure. When I come under pressure, this has kind of been the thing I've leaned on. It's kind of my crutch. It's kind of the thing. I uh, just relieve a little bit of pressure. But then I feel guilty. And I'm saying, like, and then you keep fighting. Let me tell you what. You don't need better sin avoidance techniques. You need a new vision of what God's heart looks like. If you, oh my God, if you knew what God's heart looked like for you, that little demon sin could not hold you back any longer. The doubt would be kicked to the curb, somebody. If you understood, Jesus is raising up a generation who are heart hungry for God. They're passionately in covenant with Jesus. They want more of his presence. They want to bring you more pleasure. They want to hear his tender whispers. They want to know his heart and have a connection. They want to spend time in his presence. Come on, they want to spend time with a tribe of people that are going hard after God. I, I'm going like, amen myself. Come on, preach that, Sean. That's a good word right there. Ooh. I'm teasing. I'm not that arrogant. I'm just teasing. Y'all know that. I believe that right now God has taken his church from a Christianity of religious rituals to holy passion. Right? He's taking you from speed dating to an eternal dress rehearsal. He took them to a wedding. He could have did this miracle any place, y'all. He did it at a wedding. Ding, ding, ding. Like the, the old fashioned in the cartoons, right? The light bulb would go on. Or the emojis, the little storm, the little, I don't know, mushroom clouds blow up on the side of the brain. It's like God is about divine fervency. Now, let me throw this out there. I think many people get to the church meeting, but they never get to the wedding. And you know why? <laughs> Your shout tells me whether or not you got to the meeting. Yeah. I'm not saying you always got to shout. But I'm telling you what, when you get to a wedding, how many of you know, you come to a wedding and when they go, and now I just recently did it for a gal that works on our staff, uh, to our, our, our home church worship leader. Yeah, I, I, my wife and I, we did the officiated ceremonies. I now pronounce you, everybody cheered through stuff. They went crazy, right? How many of you know, it's a celebration. I know when you just had a Christian meeting and I know when you got to the wedding. I, you're, 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 you're vocal when you made it to the wedding, okay? I'm just saying. Many people get to the song service, but they never get to the heart of the Father. Because you whisper some, some words, but like, where's the feeling in that, right? Like, I'm a, if, I'm a, if I, I really care about my brother, man, this is a precious brother, Zach, right? What if it's his birthday and I go, happy birthday to you. Uh, Wait, 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 I'm kind of distracted. Let me get on my cell phone. Oh, yeah, yeah. Happy birthday uh, uh, to you. Oh, man, I can't believe she's wearing that outfit today. Uh, happy. Come on, how many of you know? Some of us, that's our worship. Jesus can't even hold your attention during the song service. How is he going to captivate a generation of folks outside the door and he can't even get you? And there might be a couple of little ouches tonight. This, this like, like uh, 
forewarning right here. This is a couple of options. All right. I believe that, that in a, as a nation, I believe the Church of North America, we're in John 2. I felt like God prophetically spoke this to me. I got a chance to sit on a round table with a lot of prophetic voices and national intercessors uh, that actually convene here in this state. It just happens to be in Dallas with a spiritual mom of ours. And we just pray and say what God is saying. And this is what I share, this thought. I believe we're in John 2. Now follow me. In John 2, Jesus makes a whip. He makes a wine. He makes a whip. Pastor John, he makes some wine. I believe that we've seen Jesus make a whip. Come on, how many of you heard of Epstein and Weinstein, right? Jeffrey, right? Epstein, Harvey, Weinstein, right? One guy is a, kind of this, uh, he was uh, using Giselle, whatever her name was, and they were getting younger, underage girls, and he's a pedophile, but he had this uh, multiple money, he had this plane, they would go out to an island, different people, Clinton, uh, Ex-President Clinton was on that and many, many others. And there's a blacklist. They don't want people to find out, right? But he is convicted of that. Like, he gets exposed. For years, he's doing this. And, like, the rich of the rich aren't saying something. He gets exposed. He gets caught. Then here's Harvey Weinstein. He's a Hollywood producer. And all of a sudden, all these women that had were doing movies for him all have come out. Different people. I think even most recently, I even think Brooke Shields came out and said something. But different ones. He took advantage of them because he said, okay, in order to do this movie, hey, I'm going to need you to do this for me. And obviously, it was some sort of sexual favor. And let me just say, Jesus isn't just making a whip on the Epsteins and the Weinsteins. Weinsteins, you got to understand that Jesus has made a whip. And, like, I I'm just going to throw this out there. It puts a little bit of fear of God in me. Like if I'm doing something behind closed doors and it's not right, why do I applaud that they got exposed not thinking that the whip is going to make its way to me? Well, hey, I'm just saying this. I think a new awe and a new fear of the Lord has got to come. I imagine the, the disciples, like, they're, they're like, what happened to turn the other cheek, Jesus? What happened? And they see him making a cat of nine tails and overturning tables and whipping folks out of church. And it's like, turn the other cheek. Like, that's a different message, different context. Not today, boy. Boom, and he's whipping them out. Because why? God is cleaning his church. He's making sure it's a church of one agenda, not marketing and all the other slick packaging and all the other man-made humanistic things that have slipped in. He's going to take back his church. And if you read a chapter later, signs and wonders come through after this house becomes a house of prayer. Like, <laughs> I wish I could see walk right there, but I can't see walk. I mean, I mean, I mean, some of y'all know that. Some of y'all know that. Right. He's making a whip to stop religious violations, but he's making wine to release corporate celebrations. Yeah. Say that again, Sean. Okay, I will. He's making a whip to stop religious violations, but he's making wine to release corporate celebrations. I believe the joke that the North American church needed was greater than what she thought. And that's why COVID wasn't just a two week shutdown and everything was back to normal. It was like two plus years and it's still folks getting COVID because I believe God has given us a jolt. I don't believe God sent COVID-19. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. But if you read Ecclesiastes, Jesus, God can use every season. There's a time for this, there's a time for that. And so God has ordained and appointed times. And I think it's a time because in the midst of this, I believe, and here's this thing, we're getting a jolt that everything that can be shaken will be shaken. It is the whip, but understand in the same chapter, God is making wine. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I felt like the Lord gave this to me, so I'm just going to throw it out there. If God, I felt, told me, he's not going to put post-COVID-19 new wine into pre-COVID-19 old wine skins. Part of what God is doing with the church is he's reorganizing our hearts, reorganizing our focus and church structure so signs and wonders can come back to the house. We in John 2, y'all, but he makes a whip because he's a good God. He's also going to make some wine, right? Okay, let me just stop and say, it's no time for entertainment Christianity right now. It's not time. We don't, we don't need any more Christian celebrities. We need Christian soldiers. Come on, somebody. It, it's time right now. Let's just say what it is, right? We, we cannot play church, have entertainment, right Christianity, because why? A demon-possessed culture needs a Holy Ghost spirit-filled church. Come on, somebody. A culture reeling with addictions needs a church that understands the anointing of God. We can't be playing games, right? A church that has demonic bondages 
addictions, obsessions, and don't know a world, doesn't even know who they are pronoun-wise. I'm telling you what, they need a church where there is the fire of God and the new wine of the baptism of the Holy Ghost on top. This is what the world is calling for. This is what we need. Wine at a Jewish wedding was more than what we can understand. First of all, their water was horrible, right? So it wasn't like, oh, I'm just gonna give me some water. I got my little water flask, and give me a nice little water out the filter, and everything's cool. No, 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 the water was horrible. So wine took on a greater proportionality. Now, the fermentation of their wine was different, but I'm not gonna lie to you, you still could get a buzz from their wine. It's evident from the passage, right? And so why did the Jewish wedding, first of all, I just did a wedding, that entire wedding was probably about four hours long, counting the wedding and the reception. Not a Jewish wedding. Jewish wedding can go seven days. It can even go 14 days. Like, they, they we're going to celebrate, right? Celebrate good time. Come on. Do, 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 do. Right? They're going two weeks long. Well, today, the father of the bride is responsible for paying for the wedding, right? Because I'm giving my daughter away, and this guy, presumably, in an old-fashioned kind of roles, Take it and consider, you're gonna take care of her and stuff, so oh, this is my last big expenditure, she's not on my bill anymore, you know. I mean, I guess that's the mentality of it. In Jesus' day, it was just the opposite because the gal was valuable, and so there was a dowry given, so the bridegroom and their family would pay for the wedding, so follow me, it's different. So scholars believe that Mary probably was related to the groom because she took personal interest and she was invited and Jesus was invited and he brought five extra dudes with him that they were kind of saved and gonna get more saved. They might be part of the reason why they ran out of alcohol at the party, okay? Just, they still trying to get right, okay? And so here they are and they run out of wine. Now wine, running out of wine at Jewish wedding, first of all, it was an omen that the marriage would not go well if you ran out of wine. It was more than just, oh man, let's go down to get go and get some more wine for the party, Jack. No, 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 you, you, you ran out, you ran out. And the other thing is, we have a wedding list of people we're gonna invite to our wedding. Back then, Cana, the entire town could show up. And you had to be ready for them. You had to have enough food, enough wine for everyone. If you didn't, it was embarrassment. It was heightened embarrassment. I was reading one scholar that was talking about it. They said it can literally start fights in a city like between the bride's family and the groom's family because you embarrassed my daughter. You should have bought enough wine. And they, they could go straight Hatfield and McCoy, Biggie Tupac, I mean, oh. Republicans, Democrats. I mean, it could be war because you ran out of wine. And so somehow Mary saw this. And so she goes to Jesus and she says, Jesus, they run out of wine. Now let me stop. Everybody look at me for a second. I'm only going to go about 10 more minutes and we're going to pray. Everybody needs a Mary in their life. You need somebody in your life to tell you you're running out of wine. You need somebody in your life to tell you, hey man, your temper and your, your anger management stuff is not working because you're, you're mad all the time. You need somebody to tell you, why are you always grunt? Why are you always complain? Why do you always talk bad about people? Why is there always a depressed cloud? You need somebody that's gonna be honest. I need some, I got some Marys, male and female, in my life to say, Sean, man, I, you're, you're a bit in the flesh right now. Or Sean, I'm noticing some tendency. Do you got somebody in your life Come on, somebody give a shout out for a small group leader or their pastor. You got a mirror in your life that can be honest enough. Come on, if I run out of wine, don't tell me, hey man, we got a whole boat room full of wine in the back. It's all good, we good, right? And you go to pour, and a couple drops come out. You need somebody who's gonna get honest and say, the wine has run out. Come on, say it with me. The wine has run out. We need it. And, and I think that's where we're at right now. Can I just say that? The wine has run out. It's not a judgment. It's an observation, right? I think when we think we gotta do more slick packaging to get more people to come into church, well, we're, hear me, hear me. I, I, I believe in, I want as many people in the house of God as possible. But when our value system is that we want more buns in seats than Holy Ghost in the room, our wine is run out. I'm just gonna tell you, right? Hey, I, we're gonna be Holy Ghost and if less people come, those people can fill, and they're going to go get more people. So at the end of the day, you can have more people filled, but you're going to have a wine of the Spirit being poured. And I think the mentality today is whatever I can do, however I can entertain you, I, I won't talk about the cross. I won't talk about repentance. I won't talk about literal devil. I won't tell you have your hashtag rest life now as opposed to come deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow after him. I'll give you platitudes, I'll give you TED Talks, I'll give you personal life coaching, I'll stroke you and tell you how great you are, and stop it. We need to save North American Church, the wine is run out. Yeah. 
We need to get the Holy Ghost flowing back in the church again. We can't be ashamed of praying folks through to the Baptist Holy Spirit. We can't be ashamed of Holy Spirit. Oh, I, I, I see these churches. You were birthed in a movement of fire of the Holy Ghost and the wine of the Spirit being poured out. And now you're at a point where you don't even pray for the sick. I have pastor friends of mine, okay. Can I get some off my chest for a quick minute? And I'm like, I have pastor friends of mine talking about, oh God, open the heavens. And I'm like, bro, bro, you pray God open the heavens, you won't even open your altar talking about God when you open the heavens. How you gonna have God open the heavens, you won't even open your altar. You don't even get time for altar. And you want, well, if God opened the heavens, it would destroy your church. The new wine will rip through your old wine skin so quick. That's that was split in half. Because you never presented God with a commensurate wine skin for the wine you want poured out in your house. Oh. Okay, okay, okay. I got it off my chest. I'm a lot better now. There we go. That's what I needed. The wine is run out. We're more concerned about entertaining people than equipping them. The wine is run out. We leave the absolutes of scripture out and don't call people to their need of a savior. The wine is run out. When there's no call to repentance, no pick up your cross, no deny yourself, the wine is run out. Let's just get honest. We need the wine back in the house again. We need the wine back in the house again. When you do two songs, an offertory, a 23 minute sermon, and you call that church, you're getting people in and out like in and out burger, we need wine in the house, right? I'm telling you what, they say a third of the people never made it back in the church. After COVID, they're still watching online, sofa saints sipping cappuccinos, sitting at home. And I get it, some people may have some true health crisis and they can't do it. But as I said before, you making it to Target, you making it to Walmart and Old Depot, how come you can't make it to the house of God, okay? Just saying, just, I'm just saying, okay? I'm just saying a couple things right now. But the other thing is on us. If all we have is a predictable, dry town, dry creek bed church service, if I'm a nominal Christian, I'm going to stay at home and drink my latte and not come. But if you got worship with the presence of God, you got an altar, you got the power of God, you're not going to keep me out of that church service. I'm going to get up out of bed, put on my clothes, wash my food, come on. I'm coming to the house. We got to get wine flowing again. Some of them folks, they maybe they made the right choice in coming because what you have is a mutation and what they're thirsting for is to run into a tavern but what they're pouring out there is in contrast to what's raining out there. Everybody take a deep breath. Do a smile break with me. Take a deep breath. Do a smile break with a brother. <laughs> First step to revival is recognition. You got to come clean. I need, I need a fresh outpouring. I need new wine in my life. Soren Kierkegaard, the 19th century theologian, he says, Christ turned water into wine, but the church has succeeded in doing something even more difficult. The church, modern church, has turned wine into water. Jesus turned water to wine. Soren Kierkegaard says the church has done something literally like more head scratching and even more difficult. It's turned the supernatural entity of what the church ought to be. It's turned wine back into water. I hunger, you hunger for a church service is more of a reflection of God's nature than man's nature. That's what I think he's saying in that. And, and, and so here's now what's going on. For the record, I love Mary. I think she's awesome right here. Come on, Mary says they have no wine. And here's what Jesus said, woman is not my time. Now, what would you have done? What would you have done? You married, you, came, you brought the problem to Jesus. You saw that the family, they run out of wine. It's going to be catastrophic. It's going to be on Jerusalem TMC. It's going to be bad. Oh they about to go Tupac Biggie out in the street. They're going to be fighting. It's going to be Bridezilla, man. It's going to be awful. And so she goes to Jesus and said, Jesus, they run out of wine. Woman, it's not my time. My hour's not come. What does that have to do with me? You would think, Mary, tell between her legs. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Not Mary. What does Mary do? She goes over to disciples. She says, whatever he tells you to do, you do it. Now, for a long time, we know Jesus would do the miracle. We read it, right? So I thought, okay, anybody else see the paradox in this? He just got finished saying, woman. He didn't say mom. He said woman. So now he's beginning to cross his threshold that I'm going to do. And he always obeyed the father, but now, right? And he's saying it's not his time. 
Things happen in seasons. God who's outside of time, come on somebody, he didn't need the, he didn't need the quantum realm and Ant-Man and the Wasp and quantum mania, he's outside of time, right? But he operates in times and seasons. Then he's saying, it's not my time. But what does he do? He goes and does the miracle. So I, I, I'm like, okay, I, I, gotta, I gotta get a revelation. I gotta understand this, man. So I start pulling out all my commentaries, right? I gotta I got study all these commentaries, old commentaries, pulpit commentary, right? The Bible knowledge commentary. Then I'm pulling out Logos Bible software. I've got probably 60 Bible, and, I, and no one's giving me a good answer on this. You know how you're like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna have to share this with somebody. I need something better than that right there. And then all of a sudden it dawned on me. All right, I'm gonna submit something to you. You ready for this? The clue to why Jesus did do the miracle is found in what Mary did do. Right after she's told it's not his time, she goes to disciples and says, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Let me submit something to you. And, and I'm submitting it to you, right? I believe that expectancy accelerates the timeline of heaven. That when God finds an atmosphere where she said whatever, Jesus tells you to do, do it. What she's, what she's communicating is, I'm expecting he, he's still going to do it. And, okay, I believe that an outpouring of the Holy Ghost originally designated for 2024 can hit you in 2023 if you're expecting. Flip side, though. as expectancy can speed up the timeline of heaven, I believe that passivity can delay the timeline of heaven. Smith and Wigginsworth wept over Lester Summerall and said, before you die, you're going to see the beginning of the greatest move of God. You believe that I've seen great moves. Smith and Wigginsworth, a great man of God that saw revivals, brought revival to New Zealand, Australia, impacted Britain, impacted the United States of America, and impacted Oakland, California, where I'm from. Literally, first assembly church there was birthed out of a Smith and Wigginsworth meeting. He's weeping over a man of God, and he said, before you die, you're going to see a mighty move of God. Uh, Lester and Tomorrow went to be with the Lord, and, and I don't know that you could say that we saw that move, right? W.J. Seymour, one-eyed black man who is the catalyst God used at Azusa Street revival, he prophesied that 100 years later there'd be a greater than Azusa Street that would hit the United States of America. If it was 100 years from Azusa Street, we passed that. If it was 100 years after his death, we just passed that. Can I submit something to you? Stick with my logic. Mary expectancy accelerates the timeline of God. Some people go, oh, those, those guys who missed it, their prophetic words were off. No, no, maybe the prophetic words were on, but just as expectancy can accelerate the timeline of God, maybe non-expectancy has delayed an outpouring that God has designated, and there's something in me right now where I say, God, don't let it pass by. Don't let another generation miss their souls at stake, God. We as believers, the onus is on us. We need to get some Mary on us, and we need to understand, I'm not reading all the outward barometer, like natural uh, indications of where a generation, they say this generation coming up is the most agnostic, the most atheist, the most addicted, the most hashtag church hurt moving on Twitter, but none of that matters when God decides he's gonna pour out his spirit on Gen Z. You'll get a Jesus revolution. Come on like the boomers and the hippies did. But we need some folks. I, I just say this, Lord, deliver me from people that have non-expectation on them. Right? You, Mr. Theologian, you can parse verbs, you can do the perfect exegesis, you got all that stuff, but you're dry. Give me a grandmama in a rocking chair that will slap some anointing over my hand and believe for my healing if I'm back to cancer over that theologian any day. And I don't think it, you can, it, they don't have to be enemies or anything like that, but I'm telling you, deliver me from non-expecting Christians. The hour's too late. I don't want to be around you because now I'm not talking about unbelievers. I'm talking about believers who are unbelieving believers, right? And you need to believe like the disciples ended in this passage. Oh, are you guys with me? Ooh. It's embarrassing. Not just that we ran out of wine. You know what the embarrassing part? I'm only going to be, I'm only going to be negative for two more minutes. It's not just embarrassing we ran out of wine. The embarrassing part is we fake fullness. You, you ever get like knockoffs or replicants, right? And they, they use the term F-A-U-X, which I think is French, it means faux, like that's faux leather. 
We used to call it pl plastic leather. And if you had a plastic leather, we grew up in the hood, we would light a match, you could light it, and your, your jacket would run away from the fire. Like, oh, you got pleather, you don't have real leather, right? We got full fullness Christians. We're fake fullness. And here's the thing, you can't get full until you acknowledge your wine has run out. As long as you act and dignify, you got it all together, that type of pride does not receive the grace it requires of faith to receive the baptism of the Spirit of fire. You gotta acknowledge, I'm not full. I need more of Jesus. I'm not gonna fake fullness. I'm not gonna fake it. I'm gonna say, I need God. You may be filled with the Holy Ghost and have an awesome prayer language, but you need to be up here tonight and get a fresh baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. I'm not gonna fake fullness, right? I'm not gonna give the appearance that I got it flowing and going, when in reality, the wine has gotten weaker. It, when she said the wine had run out, how many of you know, leading up to it, the wine is getting lower and lower, and I don't know, maybe they're not gauging it, but what typically would happen, watch this, is they would mix water with the wine to spread it out to more people. They would water it down so more people, and that's what the guy told us. Most people serve the weaker wine. What he's saying is, you would water down your wine to get people a little bit of grape juice in here, just a little ferment, like, you know. And I think what happens is when you fake in fullness, after a while, you begin to water down your faith. You begin to water down your witness. You begin to water down your worship, your prayer time, your devotional life. You begin to water down, and that's already a sign that they'll stop. When you feel like you gotta water it down, that's already a time when, no, you gotta get Mary on you and say, you, I run out of wine, somebody, I'm gonna hit an altar tonight. I ran out of wine, I'm not gonna fade it anymore. I need an outpouring. I need fresh wine pouring. My family, there's too much at stake. Junior, how, how, how is Junior gonna grow up and really run after God if you're faking fullness? He needs to see a mom or dad that knows how to build an altar even in their home. And now they'll be going to see. I want my kids to hear me in the wee hours of the morning and say, that's dad crying out for God. What's going on? They just go into the refrigerator. But they see me on my knees weeping in my prayer room. I wanted my kids to see that. I'm not going to fake it. I'm not going to fake fullness. I'm going to acknowledge I need wine. Mary said, do what he tells you to do. She created an atmosphere of next level expectation that triggered the first miracle of Jesus out of the timeline. <laughs> Hashtag drop mic. All right. Katie, give me two minutes. Wherever you at, Katie, come up on the keys because I'm done. Two minutes. I hear it's Pavlovian. I hear music. Oh, okay, that's true. That's true. I hear music and I begin to shut up. So here it is, man. I love this because when she said, do what he tells you to do. Here is the thing. She understood God works in the middle of expectation. In a moment, you're going to come to the altar, but you have to have some expectation. Yeah. Of over my years that I've seen, I don't know, I'll just say thousands of people baptized in the Holy Ghost. You say, Sean, is there anything that you've noticed? And I'm, I'm going to act like my man Liam Nelson and take it. Over the years, I've acquired a unique skill set which makes me particularly dangerous to men like you. If you return my daughter, it's fine. But if not, I will hunt you, I will find you, I will, you know, I, I've acquired a unique skill set of praying for people. And what I do now, and I know to do this, I first go to the people that I sense expectation on because they're going to get it the quickest. And then I begin to work with people that maybe I don't see that level of expectation and we'll get you prayed through. But I tell you what, if we can get some folks that got expectation, it can shift the atmosphere. And if you spend all your time in the beginning on folks that's non-expectation, like the, the meeting can, you know, like go like that old, I don't know, was it a pantyhose commercial with a woman's <laughs> like her stockings were saggy. I just remember as a kid, my grandma watched it come out, I thought it was the funniest thing. She got saggy. Like, <laughs> Spidey holes, right, right. The, the meeting begins to sag because you didn't find expectation. But let me say something. I'm not blaming leaders and pastors and people. I'm saying it's on us. We should come to church with expectation. I don't need pastor to coax me to be expected. I don't need pastor to coax me uh, that I need to worship my God. I'm coming. You, if anything, you're going to have to tell me to dial it back, okay? Because I'm coming like full throttle. I'm coming like, you, are you ready for all this? Like, I'm, I'm, like, we need some Christians. We need to break this subdued Christianity thing, right? Expectation means you're desperate. Desperate people aren't quiet. 
Revolutions, oppressive governments have found they can hold the people back up until the point they get desperate. When they get desperate, demonstrations and riots and protests, and all of a sudden you see overthrow of dictator dictatorial governments, and the only way we're gonna overthrow the false satanic, and I'm not I'm not making a political, natural political. When I say government, I'm talking about the powers and principalities over a region. The only way we're gonna overthrow the, the, the corrupt government of the demonic spirit realm. He said, we got people that are desperate that I want to get somebody free. If you lose your expectation, write it down. I'm going to give you one of them tweets. If you lose your expectation, you lose your potential for a miracle. All right. If you lose your expectation, you lose your potential for a miracle. I'm not letting them hear. He said, hey, whatever it tells you to do. Okay, so what does Jesus do? Jesus said, go get water. Wait, wait, talk about Jesus. We need wine. We don't need water. Isn't that crazy? Jesus tells them to get water when in fact that's the opposite of what they need. They get it. So there's six pots, 30 gallons each, of Jewish purification waters that when people come in, they would clean themselves. For all sense of purpose, they have 180 gallons of Purell, hand sanitizer. Jesus is going to turn 180 gallons worth of Purell, but he tells the disciples first, fill it with water. Why? Isn't that Jesus? Before he does a miracle, you have a part in the miracle. Not that Jesus couldn't turn empty space molecules into wine. Uh, if you understand, I, I was reading a scientific report of what it took to turn water to wine. They said that the amount of energy and power is the amount it took to create the universe in the first place. It's, it's impossible what it would take to turn water to wine. So this is creation level miracle right here. One of Jesus' strongest miracles ever. Don't just think, okay, he just touched it, he got a little alcohol in it, now it's wine. No, no, no. Do a Google on that. Google me on that. This, there's no water to wine, the molecules and everything. And I was a computer engineer, but I had to take physics, I had to take chemistry, all that stuff. So I know a little, 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 little bit. The pathway to your miracle, what, what is it saying when Jesus tells me to get water? The pathway to your miracle sometimes doesn't make sense. Why do I need to speak in tongues? Tongues seems weird to me. Well, guess what? If getting water in order to get wine seems weird to you, you wouldn't go get no wine that day. Because what if they would have went, all right, I'm going to get a cup. This is stupid. I stopped. That cup of water in that 60-gallon pot would have been all the wine they had. Watch this. The amount of water you filled was the amount of wine that was given. Yeah. I'm sorry, pastors. I don't care. That's too funny. No disrespect. I just got fired up. The participation in miracle begins by doing something that makes sense. Speaking in tongues didn't make sense to me. It doesn't. The Bible says he who speaks in tongues doesn't speak to man, speak to God. So he just said it doesn't make sense. It is designed that way. It wasn't meant to make sense to you. It's made to make sense to God. How did you up here speak Swahili? Anybody in the room speak Swahili? Fluent. If I speak fluent Swahili, you, you would kind of turn your head and look at me kind of funny, right? You think it's a pretty language, but you but how many of you know you don't have a problem with it because there's somebody somewhere that understands that and speaks that. Well, what I'm telling you is you speak in tongues. The Bible says it's the tongue of angels. Somebody somewhere speaks that. There's about 100,000, I think I've heard. Over, I think I may, may need to be fact-checked on it. But there's tens upon tens of thousands of languages in the world, active as well as dead languages. How do you know whether or not it isn't a language that was spoken? Like what kind of linguistic PhD doctorate are you? But even if it doesn't, the words release power. The Bible says, whoever speaks in a tongue, they edify themselves. We don't use that word like unless you're a church, it's Christianese. But it's like you had a dead car battery, and man, you're on the side of the road, and AAA or whatever it is, tow service comes through, and they put the jumper cables on your battery, and then now you can start your car. It can be said they edified your battery. The Bible says anyone speaks in a tongue, edify himself. It's like God jump starts. You get up in the morning, you're feeling depressed, you're feeling confused. You're feeling lost, you're feeling lonely. All of a sudden, you start praying in a language and you edify your spirit. Your eyes get brighter, your head, your shoulders roll back. You feel timid and scared. You start praying in the Holy Ghost. You get courage on you. All of a sudden, you feel like God is distant. I start praying in my heavenly language. I love what Paul says. He said, I'll pray in my understanding and I'll pray in my spirit. So I'll pray in tongues, but then I'll pray everything I know to pray. I reach a ceiling and I go, okay, that's all I know how to pray. But guess what? I got a weapon, devil. I can pray above my understanding. I'm not limited to what I understand. And this is what the disciples were saying. If it was what I understood, it would be Jesus 
You should be telling us to go get wine somewhere. Tell us where wine is hidden someplace in a cave. But no, you're telling us to get water. It doesn't make sense. So I can just see him do it. And then the next stage, Jesus says, take that water and give it to the head drink waiter. And we said it. It said when they draw, had drawn the water. So I say drawn the water. Everybody got that, right? We took a moment. So I could just see these dudes, they sheepishly. <laughs> and this dude, I see this dude, I forgot my wife watches, she like cooking shows, and I forgot this one dude, he's like a, a judge of foods, and everybody's all scared, like, oh, what is he gonna say? And I guess he can like give him a thumbs up or a thumbs down or whatever like that. And I'm like, oh my God, is he gonna, and all of a sudden, this dude drinks it, and his eyes fill up, and the guy says, most people, Man, sit on the watered down wine at the end. Save the best wine in the beginning. But he's saying, I expected at this point you would come at me with some boom farms. But you broke out with Napa Valley 2008. Oh my goodness, who does this? And the crazy part about it is, I love this. The head waiter didn't even know the miracle had taken place. The disciples saw it and they believed. But guess what? They learn a valuable lesson that when Jesus tells you to do something, it doesn't need to make sense because at the end of the day, it's going to make history. Yeah. Yeah. Look at your side eye, Kyle. It doesn't need to make sense. It just needs to make history. Yeah. Obedience. Somebody say obedience. Yeah. I'm done. I've gone over my speaking time. In a moment, quick moment, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. But as we do, understand this. The disciples believed. And at that point in time, anytime God told them to do something that didn't make sense, North American believers, do not release your cognitive gray matter. Because even according to a Russian study, if you're the genius of genius in this room, you only use 10% of your cerebral gray cortex. That is, if you will, a thimble. So think of a thimble of wisdom is your brain. And a drop in that thimble is how smart you are. And you're talking about the infinite God of the universe. You think you're going to figure out God using a drop of wisdom in a thimble to figure out a God that can, the world cannot contain, heaven and earth cannot contain him. Let me just say something to you. You better guess again. <laughs> you can figure God out. That would make you God. And that's why people don't want to acknowledge aspect they can't figure it out because deep down inside you're still trying to play God and if I would say outside of non-expectation then the next greatest hindrance to receiving from Jesus salvation back to the Holy Spirit are I'm just going to say it control freaks when you always want to be in control it's hard to allow the Holy Spirit to be in control but if you're in control guess what wine is going to run out pretty consistently we live in a society where stuff has run out. But why does God let stuff run out? You ready? Everybody look at me. Final thing. Often God lets you run out of something so you can run into something. <laughs> By the way, Jesus, I just thank you, God. All across this place, the Spirit of God is in this place. You love your people. And Lord, I thank you that this miracle speaks of the power of God to bring conversion. When God can turn water to wine, there's little doubt that God can turn my depression to joy, my heartache to this amazing feeling of elation and joy and peace of mind. That Jesus did this miracle where everyone was expecting the worst is going to happen now. But what can Jesus do? Jesus can give you an alternate ending to what you initially planned. Too often, we live in the illusion of our own self-sufficiency. I can do it. I can make money. I'll get my degree. I'm marketable. I've got a little influence. I got this. We live, let me say it again. You live under the illusion of our own self-sufficiency, but the illusion is shattered on the day that the wine runs out, your peace runs out, your, your back ground of folks that pat you on the back, you don't make the business deal. You got problems in your family. Those investments don't do as good as you did. The interest rate went up and now financially you've got a health issue. Somewhere along the line without Jesus, the wine will always run out. But the good news tonight and the good news is in Cana is that if Jesus is at the wedding, 
He's not going to let the wedding end on bad wine. And if you're here tonight, it doesn't have to end on bad wine. It can we end on the best wine you ever tasted. I'm going to do this quick and rather do a lot of time. If you're here tonight, you're not right with Jesus. The power of conversion is not just seen in, in the creative of a water to wine. It's in a heart that has been dead, all of a sudden being created into a heart that is alive. You cannot live life to the fullest till you understand the one that gives the fullness of life. And what will it cost you? I was talking about this earlier. You have to repent. You got to acknowledge wine runs out. That's what repentance is. It's acknowledging, I can't do it on my own. Wine has run out. I'm not going to play a charade. I'm not going to pretend like the next party is going to do the trick. The next person holding my arm. How many likes I get on social media. How many business deals I can swing. How this, how that. No, I'm just going to get honest. Wine has run out. I need to go to Jesus and tell him the why. That's repentance. You got to come to him and say, it doesn't work apart from you. And it wasn't meant ever to work apart from you. I need you. And the good news is that you're at his wedding right now. If you're here right now, you say, Sean, I need to surrender to Christ. I need to give my life to God. Or I need to come back to Jesus. Or the current activities of my life, I know God's not blessing. If that's you, wherever you're at right now, slip your hand up. Slip it up right now. Yes, yes. Say, yes, I need to surrender. Yes, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Yeah. Yes, five hands, six hands, amen, seven hands, awesome, eight hands, nine, nine, I love young people, if I'm counting young, nine hands, I see nine, if I'm counting young people, 12 hands, come on, I'm not going to discount young people, they, they, what is it about young people, when you give an opportunity to come to Jesus, they will, but you get a couple more revolutions around the sun, and we start thinking we don't need him, no, that's about to change. All those that lift your hand, would you simply right where you are? I'm not going to call you forward, but I'm not ashamed to do it. Neither should you be ashamed to do it if I did call you. But I just believe this whole place is an altar. If you lift your hand, would you stand up right where you're at? Hand up, stand up. Just do it. Hand up. And, and here's my thing. If standing up is difficult, how are you going to stand out there? And I love that because I said it. Everyone that lifted their hands stood. Let's all pray together. Heads bowed, eyes closed. It's not about looking around. It's about right now. You and the Lord. Because I think there's some people that are sitting, but you need to rededicate your life in the same way the disciples were disciples, but when they saw this, they believed, and God wants to breathe upon your faith again. Let's all pray this together. Come on, family. Say this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I confess you, Lord of my life. I believe in my heart. God raised you from the dead. Lord, I repent. I turn to you. The wine is run out, and you're the wine maker. I thank you, Jesus, that you died for me. And as I repent, you receive me. I thank you, Jesus, that you love me. You've forgiven me. You are my Lord. And I declare tonight, I'm a child of God. And I got victory over the enemy. And Lord, I will serve you all my days. In Jesus' name. And don't sit down. Just put your hand on your heart. I just want to pray for you as you're standing. And I just want you to know God. Oh, this is a wedding. I brought you to a wedding. I didn't stand you up to make you feel bad. I stood you up to make you feel God. This is a moment where God can just highlight. X marks the spot, but it's not like there's a sniper rifle on you. No, you're a bullseye for blessing tonight. Lord, I just pray. You don't have to repeat this. I just pray right now that the love of God, the wedding level bliss of God would hit every heart. I break depression, addiction, loneliness, spirit of suicide. I break any kind of heartache. I pray you would cancel the traumatic, traumatic triggers of past upbringing coming up. I pray, God, that they would sense the reality of the Lord. And some of them, it may not be their first time standing, but it could be their most significant time. Because, Lord, I declare from the crown of their head to the soles of their feet, you would envelop them with God, the love, and fill their hearts with the new wine. We're not talking about like something you can get down at the local liquor store. We're talking about wine as a metaphor of Holy Spirit being poured out in fullness, 100% proof. We run into the tavern. We're not drinking water down rain now. We're saying, God, we want the rain of your presence to rain on these lives. And we thank you. They are loved. You are a loved son. You are a loved daughter. Let me tell you, young man, young woman, sir, ma'am, you are loved of God. Nothing will change it. God loved you before you ever stood. He loves you after you stood. If you make a mistake tomorrow, he's still going to love you. God's facial expression is going to change. And so you got to say, no matter what, I may trip tomorrow. I'm going to get back up on my feet. And I say this, if I'm going to fall, Sean Smith, 
I'm gonna fall, I'm gonna fall towards the cross. I'm not falling back, that's called backsliding. I'm gonna fall, I'm gonna fall towards Jesus. I'm gonna fall on my face at the feet of Jesus, and I know that He'll always accept me. And I'll always, and I want you to know that you are loved. And I pray favor over you. I pray favor over your life. I pray open doors over your life. I declare a noticeable, tangible blessing follows you. It literally like a blessing will chase you down. Like you may be going wonder, and all of a sudden blessing will overtake you. It's actually a scripture on that. And we thank you and we bless him in Jesus' name. Amen. You 12 people, y'all can be seated. By the way, Jesus did a lot with 12 people. All right. I love this because we've done the business part of this, if you will. But we are now going to do, and I was thinking about this, giving us a thought. We're going to do a fire tunnel. And for the sake of time, because um, I was thinking last night, we took over an hour. We flowed. It was so cool because Pastor John... And I love Pastor John. I just want to say, I, I literally enjoy this man. He's one of the reasons why I, why I come back. I love the Kalpa. I love and believe in Pastor John. But he was saying, he just couldn't, uh, his, his confidence said how much he loved what God was doing. And I just felt like, man, I, I, it's something about when you appreciate, when, when, when you're with someone that humbly appreciates what God is doing, it makes it, and then I'll, I'll tell you another thing. Now, and I've never said this, so this is just showing me a show before we go in this massive Holy Ghost moment. I really put before the Lord, I go, God, I come every year and we do a lot of nights. Now, again, it's not about me, okay? I, I, I do this out of obedience to God. But I said, God, I just need to know there's hunger. I, I need you to have the army show up tonight on Saturday night as to whether or not I should continue all these nights. I'm, I, you got a life, I got a life, there's stuff. And I, I didn't have a figure in my head, but let me just say, I look out tonight, I see all of you that came out tonight, my heart is so, I was in the parking lot praying you in. I was like, God, don't let this be a, because when we first put in what, many cars in the parking lot, I start yelling at the atmosphere. I say, angels, bring them from the north, south, east, and west. God, you're pouring out your spirit. We can't just be nonchalant. Lord, you're wanting to move in generations and stay. You know, you, you heard me pray, so, you know, it's water coming out of the fire hydrant. I guess my point is this. To see as many of you show up tonight, I think it's a tribute to what, who you are in Christ, and what God is doing in your city. And I hope you just continue to show up. Just keep, sometimes it's the ministry of showing up. That's sometimes I may not. I may come to a service. I may not have. I, I'm, I'm honest. Sometimes I'll sit in other people's service. I may not have a lot to bring. I'm kind of hoping they don't call me up to the altar to minister. I'm feeling a little, a little depleted. And all I do is I'm bringing the ministry of showing up. But that's a big ministry. So I'm so glad you did. I need someone that would slide this bench. That bench can stay, but if we could get a couple guys that would slide that bench, slide this bench out of the way. So here's what we're going to do, right? We're going to have people that have never received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Oh, good, good. That's a good idea. We're going to get those people here. Okay, buddy, look at me. Look at me for a minute. We're going to have just a line of some pastors, of small group leaders, and we're going to minister the baptism of the Holy Spirit here. So in this section right here, Jason, starting right here, we're going to get a group of home group leaders and pastors to make two lines facing each other. That will be our tunnel that will go all the way. So we're going to need all hands on deck. So we're going to have to ask for people that want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You come over here. We're going to be praying through to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Meanwhile, people are going to be lined up. And the moment you get filled with the Holy Ghost, you just turn you walk through the prayer tunnel. Now, what is a prayer tunnel? In case you've never seen it. If you ever come to an altar and somebody prays for you, put that on steroids. That's what we're about to do. We, we got people on both sides praying. And what I've observed on prayer tunnels is two or more touch and agree, right? We know if one can put a thousand, two can put ten thousand. What happens when you get 30 folks all praying that you'll be blessed? So this is key on any prayer tunnel. Because I'm, I'm hesitant sometimes. I know people want to just stop and they want to just park here, but you gotta understand there's a bunch of people behind you, so we're gonna ask you keep a little pace to you. And don't be offended, right? Y'all, y'all gonna love me. I'm California, y'all gonna love me. I'm, like, I'm standing for God in California. Take it up. Someone might nicely put their hand on the small of your back and help you a little bit if you're getting a little slow. Now if you're getting somebody's ministering over you and you're just weeping and bawling, we'll just we'll just do a, you know, like when a car is on the side of the road and the cars just go around it. We're just gonna go around you. If the power of God hits you and you go out in the power, we're going to need some folks. That may happen. I'm not, that's not the power suggestion. That's just 
Glory of God, his folks, you, you get overwhelmed. So we'll just slide you over a little bit with people, you just keep moving. And then once we get everybody through, if you wanna go back through a second time, cool. And then we will pray for the people in the circle, so the, our circle, excuse me, the lines. So the people in this line, these first two will come through, right? And they'll go on the end and the line will replenish itself. So everybody gets prayed for, so don't think, oh man, if I'm, if I'm prayer early in the line, do I get prayer? Yes, you will. You're going to get prayed for at the end when we're super warmed up, right? I don't even know prayer tunnels. You kind of have to get warmed up a little bit, all right? So every head up, every eye looking around. Who here says, Sean, I've not been baptized in the Holy Ghost. I do not have a heavenly language. Remember, don't get weird on me now. This is Jesus saying, go get water. You're like, well, that don't make sense. You don't make sense. Well, if you don't get water, you don't get wine. Come on. If you don't acknowledge that your wine has run out, you're not going to get the fresh flow. You want the baptism of the Spirit. Why? Because the Bible says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you'll be witnesses. And I believe not just a witness, kind of like, I've seen this, so I'm going to tell you what I saw. No, no. An empowered witness that when you get back to the Holy Ghost, all of a sudden, the kingdom authority, signs and wonders, your ability to hear God goes to another level. But guess what? You get a shared encounter moment with Jesus that makes Jesus that much more real to you. And let me tell you, maybe the biggest thing I've noticed is the intimacy factor and the boldness. Those two things, when I got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and then you get a weapon, the devil don't even understand tongues. You don't understand, but guess what? Neither does the devil. You speak in English, the devil speaks in English. You speak in Spanish, the devil speaks Spanish. You speak in tongues, you don't know tongues. Demons, not like I'm gonna give a whole demonology, demons hate tongues. I know that by personal experience. They hate tongues, and it's like, ah! You know, it's like teacher scratching on a chalkboard. So if the devil hates it, I don't like it. Come on, somebody, is that good theology? All right, how many of you say, I've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I do not have a prayer language, I want a prayer language, stand up, thank you, wherever you're at. Or, you have been prayed for, and you say, I don't really have fluency in my language, I got a couple of little syllables, but I need a real breakthrough, you stand up, okay, okay? All right, let me get some small group leaders or pastoral staff, stand right here in a line facing a group that know how to, and believe in or cool with praying people through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Let me get you to line up here. So we need a little bit of the veterans. Okay, love that sweatshirt, bro. All right, and we may, that, that may almost be enough, but just, just check, okay? Now, I need some others that, let's just say, uh, for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, let's, which side do you want? Do you have a choice? Any side, okay. I'm gonna jump over on this side, and Jeremy, if you jump with me, because we're gonna make sure people get ready. So we'll say, you take uh, three steps that way, and pass it which side? Well, I guess you. Monday from my back. Okay, well, then you, you just pick and choose. But sir, let's have you take a couple more steps this way. We need some more uh, small group leaders to be part of this tunnel, right? We need some more. Come on, we need some more. All hands on deck, right? This is good. Now, this is a good prayer tunnel. Now, each of y'all take a collective step towards the middle, right? Yep. I said that's about good. No, no, y'all y'all are fine. Y'all stay back. All right. So I'll start here, and these two gentlemen would pray. They'd lay hands on me, and so I'm, I'm stepping, praying. So all of a sudden, I get to a, a person. He's got a little bit more for me. I'm just going to lean into him and let him. He's got his hand on my hand or my chest. Pray. Other people can walk around. We're going to keep moving. Because why? You go, well, I don't feel like I'm done yet. Well, good news. You got all this more people that are going to be praying for you, so you don't have to be done at this point. You just keep moving, and God's going to give you more and more and more and more and more. And then I would advise, when you come out the end, spend a little moment at the altar. Don't just run out to wherever you're going to go afterwards. Spend a moment before the Lord and just soak it in. I think it's so important. It's a new wine night. Okay. Where are all my people that want the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Where are all of you at? Okay. Come come, line up right in front of them, but no one start praying. I'm going to give a little introduction. Now, as they're coming, everyone that wants to go through the prayer tunnel, as they get over here, I want you to line up right down this middle section. So once the people from the baptism of the Holy Spirit, all y'all come over here. I'm going to direct my attention to here. So Jason, if, uh, not Jason, <laughs> Sam, I'm sorry, Sam, Sam, you got to be in control of making sure people are kind of moving Sam and getting the throttle. I'm going to Jason. I know there's Jason. I know you're Sam. Hey, just did it. Oh. What, if, are y'all baptism of the Holy Ghost, folks? Okay, no line. If you're baptism of the Holy Spirit, just come right up here. Just, just conjugate. Y'all don't have to be in a line. Y'all just come up front. If you want to go through the prayer line, you need to be in this aisle. 
So anybody wants to create a prayer line, line up in this aisle, right? Are y'all not hearing me? All you guys sitting down, do you want prayer? <laughs> no, I, I just went over and over. I apologize. Thank you. Line up right behind my sister with her awesome Nirvana shirt on. Just line up straight back behind her. And then when you guys get prayed for, you guys walk through and start to get my brother right here at Sam. And you're going to go there. We got it? We got Pastor Joe. I'm going to give some a prayer so we can start. All oh, baptism of the Holy Ghost before we begin. Okay, don't need to come way up here. Don't be back here. Come way up here. Come all the way up. We'll punch you up. We want you to so we can lay hands on you. So if you need to get against the door, you need to come on. I love this. Burnt sons. Come on, my three sons. Yes, I love my sons. Okay, so all you guys look at me. And you guys can feel free to get started. I'm, I'm going to instruct, but Sam, you you got to get them going. All right, everybody look at me here. Baptism only else, right? Good news. You ready, you ready for this? Jesus wants you to receive more than you want to receive. I beg, that's an empowering belief. Because I feel like he's reluctant. Then I'm kind of begging, please stop filling me up, fill me up, please go. No, no, no. He wants you filled so much, he put it in your heart to want what he's already going to be giving you. Okay? So that's one. Number two, you receive it by faith. So faith is simply this. I ask, I believe that he'll do what he said he would do. The Bible says, no, me, earthly man, can give, yeah. I, in a sense, compared to God, I'm more of a good, like on a way lower level. If I can give good gifts to my kids, to my kids, natural kids, how much more the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So all you gotta do is ask and believe. Now the next thing is, I would only want and ask you to just worship the Lord, like with your own mouth and heart. Like, Lord, I love you, I praise you, you know you. Now listen to a spontaneous song. Don't just sing like a song that's rehearsed. Because you're not trying to tap into the brain part. You're trying to get stuff in. So just let it come out of the Lord. I love you like a spontaneous and love you. I praise you. But there will come a minute where you can't or shouldn't speak in your known language. And we're not like snakes that fork tongues. I don't think they can speak two languages in one day. But yes. But you don't have a fork tongue. You only speak one language at once. So there comes a point where you'll cease to speak in understanding. And then what will come out of your mouth? Let me, let me give you this. We'll pray. You're going to think you're making it up. You're going to think you're copying something. I guarantee you, don't worry about that. Don't worry about it. The biggest key after you believe that God is a good God will give what you ask is, I'm just going to say, break the sound barrier. I see it happen to so many people. It's like all of a sudden, and again, I, I don't want to say something in a way that that would be your reverse thing, but say a syllable comes out of my mouth. I would just say it again. Say it again. All of a sudden, fire catches before I know it. And it just came. That's how it happens. Right? Initially, it's not as fluent, though. When I first got it, I just got some syllables. But I went with it. Does it come in your head? Comes here. Now, I only gave that level of expect ex explanation to help you. If that feels confusing, kick it to the curb and just say, God, I want you. And that, that's, that's good. That'll work. Okay. All of you look at me. I'm so excited for you. Oh my God, I'm so excited. This, I will not be able to sleep tonight. That's how excited I get over this. All right, everybody smile one last time. Smile tells yourself there's no pressure. You can't feel pressure. You can't produce this. He gives it. Right? All right. Close your eyes and pray this prayer with me. You got it. Say, Lord Jesus, I confess you. It's Lord of my life. I believe in my heart. God did raise you from the dead. I ask you, Jesus, to be my baptizer, to baptize me with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So as your spirit comes upon me, hands are laid on me, I will praise you in other tongues, and I will be a witness of your glory in Jesus' name. Now, small group leaders and prayer words, give them a moment. Just I always love to let them connect. I want you guys now, close your eyes and begin to tell the Lord you love it. Just Lord, I love you. I praise you. I'm going to challenge you to lift your head up. If you're a drop your head person, lift your head up. If something might even a posture, I'll lift your head up. And you're expecting to receive. You're expecting. You're a son. You're a daughter. Lift your head up. Lord, we just pray. Father, we just ask right now that God, you would baptize them with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And Lord, out of their light, out of their innermost being will flow rivers, rivers of living water. They begin to praise you now. 
Prayer team, as you feel led, begin to step out and begin to pray. And the power of God's going to hit you. And even when the hand's laid on you, believe that in that moment, that point of contact, the anointing releases that power in the name of Jesus.
Father, we acknowledge that if we would lift you up, you would draw us unto you. So Father, we're just lifting you up right now. We're lifting you up right now. Lord, we pray a spirit of revival in this house. Lord, we pray a spirit of revival in Sam Houston. We pray, God, a spirit of revival and awakening in the neighborhoods. Lord, that there are people right now that would begin, Jesus would get on their radar. Lord, Jesus would invade their dreams. Jesus, Lord, would touch their lives. We pray for turnarounds and transformations. We pray that the power of the Holy Ghost fall on people in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Lord, we're already praying even for tomorrow morning church service, God. Although it's my last uh, service here for a minute, Lord, it's not your last. We're praying that tomorrow it would not be a normal Sunday morning, God. That you would do something that only you can take glory for. We're praying, God, right now, people would be saved, filled, healed, baptized in the Holy Ghost, delivered, marked by heaven. We're praying, God, right now. Lord, we just pray, even if you have God prayed for it, right now, turn this moment into a prayer meeting right now. Just go Asbury right now. Just begin to pray and ask God right now to pour out his presence. Begin to ask God to receive glory. Begin to ask God that literally the most underused, issued option, and it's not, option is not a word, uh, available is Jesus said, ask of me, and I will give nations. So, Lord, we are bold enough that we're saying, give us the nations, God. Give us the nations in this college. Give us the nations in this church. Give us the city, Lord. Come on. Come on. Come on. Press in a little bit longer. Come on. Come on. I need you. When I say I need you to go ask for you don't know there was an overflow prayer meeting. Just begin to pray. Begin to pray. Begin to pray. Jesus made a whip. Why? Not because he didn't like the guys in the temple. It's because they were, they were making it a, something different than what it ought to be, a house of prayer. So just begin to pray. If you're, if you're sitting down, I'm going to ask you, if you want to talk, either whisper or go out to the foyer. But if you need to, let's just, let's just spend the last minutes we got here just crying out to God. And say, God, we want more. We want more. We want more. We want more, God. Lord, we want more. We know there's more available, God. We hunger for the more. We won't settle for the less. Jesus, we want you high and exalted and lifted up in your temple. Lord, we want for you to receive glory, God. Lord, we want your spirit to pour out. We don't want the devil to have the final say. We want God to have that final say. Jesus. Oh, I love it. People start to pray now. Come on, lift up those voices. Lord, we pray. God, break the apathy. Lord, break the religiosity. Uh, God, I'm not going to say pray that over you in this house, but I'm just saying in the area. Break the religiosity. Break the apathy. Break the passivity, God. Awaken your church, God. Awaken your people, God. Awaken, 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 God. Lord, you said, God, we're going to ask the Lord for rain in the time of latter rain. You would say, flashing clouds, showers of rain, grass in the field for everyone. We cry, Father, pour out of your spirit, Lord. Lord, let it be a God that Job to you pour your spirit on all flesh. Sons and daughters of prophesy. We're seeing that tonight. Put out on all flesh. The word all flesh is all flesh, God. All flesh. Saved, unsaved. Righteous, unrighteous. Lord, those who walk with God, those who deny God. Pour out your spirit on all flesh. Lord, we pray for the youth of this area. God, the high schools of this area, the junior highs of this area. Lord, let awakenings begin. Let our point of the Holy Ghost. We, we pray for San Houston State, but Lord, we want to pray that they get saved in grade school, middle school, high school. Let prayer meetings break out. Lord, let professors and teachers and principals and superintendents get saved, Father. Baptize kids in the Holy Ghost. Lord, convict kids right in the middle of something that they're doing that will bring the school. Lord, we're praying. Let trophies come out of darkness, Lord. Let treasures come out of darkness. Lord, we're crying out in the name of Jesus. Even as I see uh, Bert's young ones coming through. Lord, we declare you are the young ones even in that age in this region, Lord. We pray the prison. Let revival break out in the prison in this city, God. Lord, let revival break out. Lord, I've been hearing stories about them. 
the hospital, penitentiary, or prison, or whatever you call it. Lord, might it just be, Father, there'd be so many inmates in this city that they would start praying, that they would see revival. Lord, Paul and Silas saw revival in a prison house. We have a precedent of this in the book of Acts. Philippian jailer and Mrs. Jailer, these old high school got saved. And they were free, but they were really bound. And Lord, we pray.